Making sense of convolutional neural networks can be a real challenge. Python libraries like PyTorch make working with neural networks easy. However, clicking together lines of code doesn't necessarily deepen your understanding of the underlying concepts. But there's a way to enhance your intuition for CNNs. And that's through visualization. Most YouTube tutorials do not show graphical representations of CNNs, simply because they are not that easy to create. But I prefer to view neural networks in 3D space from every angle. That way I can absorb way more information at once and learn even faster. I bet you're the same. And for that reason, by the end of this video you'll have a better intuition for CNNs. I promise. So what we are going to do is solving an image classification problem in Python. At the same time, I will show you 3D representations of each model layer. Bonus tip! To get even more out of this video, take a screenshot of the model and write notes on it. This way you can use the visualizations for your next coding task. Let's go! The convolutional neural network will be used to classify photos of fruit. After training, it should be able to tell a banana apart from an apple. Before looking into the Python code, I want to explore how a machine learning model perceives images. Unlike as humans, it doesn't have a sense of sight, but it works extremely well with numerical values. Every photo is made up of pixel values ranging from 0 for dark to 255 for bright. This photo of an apple has a resolution of 100 by 100. Therefore, you might assume that it contains 10,000 numbers. But that's not quite correct, because we need to consider that this is a colored image. It consists of three color dimensions, red, green and blue, from which all other colors can be blended. So the first layer of the neural network will receive a 3 by 100 by 100 tensor as input containing 30,000 numbers in total. Since a single photo isn't enough for training, I've gathered just over 2,300 photos for training. Roughly 50% containing photos of apples and 50% images of bananas. But they are in different resolutions. Now let's take a look at the script. Even though the focus of this video is on visualization and not the code, I'd like to point out that I used the PyTorch library, which is state of the art for machine learning. Among other things, it offers the functionality to unify differently sized photos in just a few lines of code. The height and width of each image are either compressed or stretched to make them both 100 pixels. Additionally, every value from 0 to 255 is scaled to a range between 0 and 1. This unification is crucial for allowing the convolutional neural network to recognize patterns in the data. With minimal effort, we get images that are 100 by 100 pixels or 3 by 100 by 100 tensors, each between 0 and 1. Alright, let's run the first block of code and move on to the most exciting question. What is the model made of? This is what a convolutional neural network looks like. It looks pretty interesting, but we are not much smarter yet. Let's break it down step by step. We know that the model input is a tensor of numbers, which is the image to be classified. Easy. And the model's output will be a single number, in this case 0 for apple and 1 for banana, depending on the input image. Got it. But what do the layers in between look like? For that, we need to dive back into the code. For our classification problem, we first use a convolutional layer, followed by a max pooling layer, then another convolutional layer, another max pooling layer, a flatten layer, and finally a linear layer. In the graphic and code, you can see that each layer has an input and output. The output of the first layer becomes the input for the second layer, and the output of the second becomes the input for the third, and so on. The input to the first convolutional layer, as noted earlier, is the three color channels of the image from our dataset. The most important part of a convolutional layer is the filter, which looks at a small section of the photo to detect edges and corners. We define the filter as a 3x5x5 tensor. We do this setting the kernel size equal to 5. Initially, it consists of random values. The filter processes a small region of the image and outputs a single value, which we represent as a blue box in the output of the first layer. 
Before we move the filter across the image, it is important to note that we've added a one pixel wide frame around each color channel of the input. We do this by setting padding equal to 1. We do this to reduce the loss of the information at the borders of the image. So we end up with a 3 by 102 by 102 input. Since we have stride equal to 1, the filter moves one pixel at a time, applying the same operation to a different section of the image. The filter continues to move until the entire output is filled. Then, another filter of the same size is randomly selected, and the convolution operation starts again. This results in another matrix of numbers that, in essence, provides a different view of the image. The convolution operation is performed with 14 more filters, giving us a total of 16 different perspectives of our photo. At this point, I should mention that the filters are not yet properly set to detect the features that distinguish bananas from apples. These are part of the model parameters and will be learned during training. So the output will probably be garbage. But this completes the first convolutional layer. The input has been transformed into an output of size 16 by 98 by 98, which now goes to the next layer, the max pooling layer. This layer also looks at small regions of the input tensor. In this case, it looks at regions of 16 by 2 by 2. However, unlike the convolution layer, it doesn't transform the values. It simply selects the maximum value from each region and pushes it to the output. We have defined stride equal to 2 for the max pooling layer, meaning the layer skips a row when moving forward. While the convolution layer is designed to recognize edges and corners, the max pooling layer allows the model to focus on deeper details and reduce the amount of information. After all, in the end we only want a 0 or 1, which means the information needs to be reduced. The combination of these two types of layers is what makes the model a true CNN. The output layer of the max pooling layer now consists of 16 49 by 49 matrices. Repeating the combination of convolution and max pooling layer increases the neural network's capability, making it even more sensitive to details in the image. That's why the output from the max pooling layer now serves as the input for the next convolutional layer. We increase the dimension of the tensor again by adding padding of 1. Which means we now have another tensor which is two numbers larger in two dimensions. This time we use a 3 by 3 filter and let it slide over the input pixel by pixel. As in the first layer we use 16 different filters resulting in a stack of 16 49 by 49 squares. We then pass the output, you guessed it, into the max pooling layer again, using kernel size and stride equal to 2. This reduces the input dimensions again by roughly half. While our input side length is 49, we can't have half pixels. So the PyTorch formula rounds it down to 48. We end up with an output of 16 by 24 by 24. So far we have reduced the input from the initial 30,000 values to 9,216 values. These values will, after training, contain all the necessary information to correctly classify the image as an apple or banana. What's missing is a way for the model to tell us which fruit is recognized. This is where where the combination of flatten and linear layers comes in. The flatten layer takes the values and rearranges them. Instead of using the tensor notation, it reshapes it into 1 by 9216. We now have a vertical line of numbers. Note that the output of the flatten layer is not true to scale. If we would use the real size, this line wouldn't fit into the picture. After the flatten layer, the linear layer follows, which weighs the individual pieces of information differently and converts them into a single value. To get the desired output between 0 and 1, we use the sigmoid activation function, which compresses the output into this exact range. Ok, let's see what our model says. Alright, that was expected. We need to train the model on our data for several epochs before we can classify correctly. Since this video is focused on model architecture, I won't go into the training process. However, I will put the script into the video description for those interested. 
But nevertheless, let's see if the model works after training. I picked some images that the model has never seen before. Okay, I will put them into the model and it looks like the training worked. Perfect. This video was only a few minutes long, but visualizing all this took quite a while. If these visuals help you understanding things better, copy the link and share it with someone who could use some visual support. That way you can help them understand CNNs better and boost the algorithm to keep me motivated to create more videos like this in the future. Thanks for watching.